The views expressed on the Jerry Cahill CF podcast are that of Jerry Cahill and guests, and not necessarily those of the Boomer Esiason Foundation. Nothing on the Jerry Cahill CF podcast should be considered medical advice. Such advice can only be given by a physician who is experienced with cystic fibrosis. The Boomer Esiason Foundation, Jerry Cahill and guests cannot be held responsible for any damage which may result from using the information on this podcast without the permission of your medical doctor. You're listening to the Jerry Cahill CF Podcast, presented by the Boomer Esiason Foundation and jerrycahill.com. Welcome to Jerry Cahill's Living, Breathing, Succeeding series, The Path Forward with CF. This show, CF, the double lung transplant surgery with Dr. Joshua Sonnet, was made possible through an educational program from Columbia University Medical Center to the Boomer Esiason Foundation. Today, you will meet my transplant surgeon, Dr. Joshua Sonnet. Dr. Sonnet is a professor of surgical oncology and chief of the Division of General Thoracic Surgery at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. He is the director of the Price Family Center for Comprehensive Chest Care, Lung and Esophageal Center. I'm Joshua Sonnet. I'm a thoracic surgeon at Columbia University. I am the chief of thoracic surgery at Columbia and I direct the Price Family Center for Comprehensive Chest Care. So. We try to take care of anybody with any chest or lung issues as a team, uh, and that particularly involves around transplant as well or any end-stage lung issues. Probably in my career, I, I'm, I'm coming close to a thousand transplants, uh, but at Columbia, as a t between myself and the team that we brought here since 2001, I think we're, we're honing in on, on a thousand just at Columbia from we're over 900 since 2001. And 2018 has been a busy year for lung transplants and we're going to be close to 80 transplants this year. There's right now three thoracic surgeons who are dedicated to uh, performing the transplants at Columbia and we're just uh, hired another one who will be here in about a half year uh, who will be who is uh, particularly trained and dedicated for transplantation. Well, the rating of transplant centers uh, are really related mostly to uh, the number of transplants you do, but more importantly, how well the transplants do, your one, three, uh, and long-term survival. Uh, and we have been traditionally, most years, above national levels of survival. Cystic fibrosis have amongst the best, the best results with five-year survival, uh, 70 to 80 percent, and we're still at approaching at 10 years, over 50 percent now, of patients doing well. For patients and their families who have end-stage cystic fibrosis and are worried or scared about transplant, I would say that's completely normal. I mean, why wouldn't you be scared or nervous uh, about needing something as big as a lung transplant? That being said, it is a blessing that we have such an opportunity and the results of lung transplants are so good right now that we can transplant somebody and perhaps in three months, uh, you can start running again or doing what you want in life and, and you will be back to your, more than back to your normal life, you will have new lungs like you've never had before uh, and feel renewed. And how long those lungs work and how well you do is continuously getting better. So, there, so there's no limits uh, to how long you can live with those new lungs. I recently saw somebody uh, that's 26 years into his lungs from cystic fibrosis. When a, when a patient with cystic fibrosis needs to really seriously consider or talk to their lung transplant team um, is a really good question and, and point. I would say first, those of you with CF, you should make sure your cystic fibrosis team and doctors, which most likely they are, are keyed in and really work closely with a lung transplant team. And I would say that the sooner you meet your prospective team, the better. Uh, that doesn't mean they're going to transplant you or you're going to get transplanted. That just means you're going to start to learn about transplant, understand about transplant, and as a team, try to avoid transplant as long as possible because we want you to live with functional lungs of your own as long as possible. On the other hand, we don't want patients getting too sick, that they're too sick for transplant or miss their opportunity because they, get too, they, they die before transplant. Uh, that, that should never happen nowadays. We should be able to get patients to transplant, get them better and feeling better. And as scary as it is, when you talk to patients that have had transplant, you'll find out that it's life changing in terms of how well patients that couldn't breathe for many, many years uh, all of a sudden feel a new lease in life. 
almost every CF patient, unless they have some really resistant antibiotic bugs, are going to be good transplant candidates. Uh, and the biggest thing we look for in cystic fibrosis patients, frankly, is, is the patient's willingness and ability to take care of their lungs afterwards, because it's a blessing they get those lungs. And most patients with CF are used to taking care of themselves, but some very young people feel the freedom of the new lungs early on, and we just have to make sure that they know how to take care of those lungs. The relationship between the patient and the surgeon is important because it helps you decide when you're really ready for transplant. The surgeons and the medical doctors have to decide when somebody's ready for transplant, and the patient has to be ready for transplant. Both have to work together at the same time uh, and both be ready for transplant, and then things will work better that way. Dual listing is when a patient uh, puts them, gets to know one, two, or several lung transplant programs to try to optimize their chance for getting an organ, because organs uh, to some respect are distributed by geography, by happenstance of where you live. So if you have the capability as a patient to fly or go to different regions uh, all across the country, I, I think it's a benefit to be dual listed. You would likely get a transplant sooner. What's the downside of that? The downside of that is if you live, say, in New York and you arrange to go to Texas, for your lung transplant because maybe they had organs quicker and you had the ability to fly there, uh, but then your care is gonna be that far away and you're not gonna be by your primary caregivers. So there, there's pluses and minuses to dual listing. We used to allocate lungs basically around the city that you lived in, a 250 mile radius around where you live, which is a pretty good radius of circle of donors. And we're hoping to bump that to 500 or 1,000 miles. Once that's range is, is increased, your need to list at several centers will almost certainly go away. Patients uh, are, quote, given priority on the waiting list completely and only based on how sick they are. And how sick they are is measured by a certain parameters. So it's completely what we say is objective. There's measured uh, parameters that add up your lung function, your CO2 level, how well you walk, are you on the ECMO machine? All these things add up and you get a unique number to you. And no two patients in the world have the same number because you keep on dividing out the number, kind of like pi, a long number. And then you're on a waiting list. So as you get sicker, you move up on the waiting list. So for instance, there was one really sick CF patient um, who we listed in the morning and transplanted that evening. It can happen, that, there's no waiting time per se, it's, it's, that's mandatory, it's just a matter of when there's a lung match for, for you. And with the new system, um, if you're sick, you're liable to get a lung transplant uh, offer and lung fairly quickly, unless you're a rare blood type. When if you're a rare blood type, or have what's called antibodies, which means uh, you have to match your blood to somebody else's blood to make sure basically it, it's acceptable, uh, acceptable antibodies. That can take a little bit longer. But even for that, we have new programs to try to make that better. So we get lung offers, we basically get lung offers 24 seven all the time. And a large portion of the lung offers are what we say not ideal lungs. Maybe they were too old, maybe they smoked, Maybe they got damaged in a car accident or had a bad pneumonia. There's all sorts of reasons. But we'll get calls all day, all night long. Uh, then at a certain point, we find some lungs that we think are good. That's when the patient may get notified. Hey, we think we have some lungs for you. At that point, the whole team is getting geared up to look at those lungs. But it may be two hours. It may be even 12 or 24 hours because there's teams around the country uh, that are also involved with, with that donor for other organs. So all the timing has to take place. And then during that timing, our team and the team on site are trying to optimize those lungs so they can be best for our patient. Then what happens is when we go look at the lungs, we send our own team out. Uh, and because no matter how perfect or not perfect we think the lungs are, nothing uh, at this point uh, can replace going 
and checking the lungs out individually. We feel them, we look inside them, we make sure they're looking well. And then only when we know that they're good enough do we bring them back and the whole process really starts for transplant, meaning it's a go, where you'll hear it's a dry run if we go and we decide that maybe they're not good enough for transplant. A dry run for your patients waiting for lung transplant is when you get all excited, you come into the uh, hospital waiting for your lung transplant. And that's the time where our team's out looking at those lungs and deciding if they're a good match for you or, or for, for anybody, frankly. Uh, a certain percentage of the time, we'll say they're, they're not good. Patients, as, as you, Jerry, have had, you said on the sixth one, I think our record is eight or nine, but we have had plenty of patients that are transplanted on the first one. A patient that comes in for what's called a dry run comes in but doesn't get the lungs. That doesn't affect their lung score or wait list time at all. There's not a certain finite amount of runs that you can be on. Again, the score is based completely on how sick you are. And that score can frankly change every day, every hour. You know, if somebody wakes up and uh, gets sick that day for whatever reason, if we input the data that shows that they're sicker, they can jump up on the allocation score really basically instantly. So whenever we do, whenever we plan a double lung transplant, we bring in what's called the primary recipient who definitely needs two lungs, unless they can just take one, but for cystic fibrosis too. But sometimes we go to check out lungs and one lung is perfect, but one lung say had a pneumonia uh, or got shot, whatever whatever was the, the issue. So we can only use one of those lungs. So the backup patient is somebody that can take what's called a single lung, which is a really good operation for that patient. But patients with cystic fibrosis because of infection uh, issues always need two lungs. Yeah, if we can get two good lungs, we're gonna uh, prioritize that CF patient for those two rather than give one single to somebody else. Lungs are matched on uh, blood type first. It has to be an acceptable blood type. And after that, it's really around size. Uh, in general, four to six inches smaller or bigger uh, can go to a patient, but we can make really big changes in the size if need be. We never transplant a lung that we don't think will work and help that patient. It's just a, it's just a question of knowing uh, how good those lungs are. Well, I mean, so the actual physical transplant, and let's say for cystic fibrosis, we're always going to be doing double lung transplants. So we have to figure out how to get access or get to both lungs. It used to be that we traditionally always did either a clamshell or the sternotomy. So clamshells where you go across your chest and open you up kind of like an old DeLorean or a car hood, uh, and you get great access and it's a good procedure. Uh, and that's what we routinely did for many years. Then we figured out, hey, we're getting better at transplant. Maybe we don't need to make such big holes and maybe we can do this smaller and smaller so the patient can recover quicker. And so I'd say for say cystic fibrosis, probably 90% now we can do through the smaller incisions near, you know, on each side on, on near the axilla. Yeah, so the ribs, the ribs are, are like this together and then we cut those ribs and then they open like a bucket handle. And they open like a bucket handle so we can peek in and then we close the bucket handle. And we can do that without breaking the ribs. We're just sort of taking the muscle between the ribs, cutting it and then opening it up. So how long a transplant, how long a transplant takes to physically perform with surgery and how quickly you get better is somewhat dependent on how sick or not sick you are going into the operation. So if it's somebody like you, Jerry, who kept yourself in really good condition where your body was optimized around your lungs and you were able to exercise, even though your lungs were at the verge of quitting, uh, then an operation may be fairly quick, six, four to six hours uh, at the quickest. And some people are off the breathing machine in less than 24 hours. And we've had people stay as long as only as seven days in the hospital. But the sicker you are and the weaker you are, the more likely you are to be in the hospital longer. Now, when I tell patients, and I, and I truly believe it, how long your operation takes, how long you're in the hospital has almost no effect on your long-term good outcome. 
It's just whatever it takes to get you better during that hospital stay will be invested to do, and then you can do well. We had one patient, who, she didn't have CF. I think she was in the hospital for four months afterwards. It was so hard. And then she didn't get readmitted for over 10 years for a transplant. So, you know, it, it, doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean that if it takes longer and it's harder, that it's not gonna be a good outcome. It just meant that it took longer. I mean, it took me an hour to get across the George Washington Bridge today. Sometimes it takes five minutes. At the end of the day, I'm over the bridge.